we're uh, going to reconvene. I'll get people to drift back towards the middle. Sorry, it took a few minutes longer. We had a we had a mic uh, snag, but we fixed that. So we we now are going to move to a um, panel on empowering communities and uh, talking about learning from the field and how that is going to uh, result in uh, documentable impact for long term. I was just talking to some of the panelists ahead of time, and I, I think they represent a really interesting selection of programs across the country from which we can learn quite a bit. I'm going to leave the introductions to Harold Cox, but just uh, two words about Harold. Harold is uh, the uh, Dean of uh, Practice at the School of Public Health. He heads up the Activist Lab. He has a long and distinguished career in public health practice, including uh, having been uh, the Commissioner of Health for uh, Cambridge before this current position. Harold, over to you. Thank you very much, Sandro. Good afternoon, everyone. This is a conversation we're going to talk about what it means to do it. What does it mean to be engaged with the community? And what are the kinds of challenges that we have as we plan, as we implement, and as we sustain programs? We're going to spend a little bit of time talking among ourselves, and you're invited to listen in. And then we're going to invite you to participate as well. And in particular, what I'm interested in you talking to us about is what kinds of successes have you had and what kinds of challenges have you had? Because indeed, it's when we think about those challenges, those are the places that we learn the most. So this is a conversation about the lessons that we have learned in implementing programs and in working with the community. We have an outstanding panelist, the group of panelists who are going to be with us. Our panelists uh, include Rain Henderson, who is the founder of Elemental Advisors and also an advisor to the Clinton Foundation. We have Tom Grilk, who is the CEO of the Boston Athletic Association and in charge of the Boston Marathon. We have Jennifer Edwards, who is director of Developing Health US Portfolio for GE Foundation. We have Jim Marks, who is the executive vice president at Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And we have Rick Brush, who is the CEO of Wellville. We have a panel that is knowledgeable, that is involved, that is energetic, that is creative, and a whole bunch of other things too. So I'm glad that they're here. I'm glad you're here also. So usually when you start with panels like this, we always start with, so what worked well for you? We're not going to start there. We're going to start with what didn't work so well, because indeed those are the things that all of us are challenged with, and so that's where I want to start. And by the way, this is just a conversation. We're going to talk to ourselves for a little while, listen in. So what didn't work so well? I'll start. All right. Because you're the only one who's had a challenge of something not working well. <laughs> um, glad great, to be here. Great. Thank you very much to my GE team for um, having the GE Foundation here. Um, you know, oftentimes when we're launching large initiatives, the journey is never linear. We were just talking about this. It's often an iterative process. Sometimes the strategy continues to emerge as you continue to listen and learn to your stakeholder community. So it is so important that you work with partners who have the flexibility to pivot. You have to be able to change direction if something is not working. And you have to sometimes have the courage to be able to say, you know, to report, we all have to report up to our leaders, to our boards, that you know what, we're not going here we're going to go here because we're more, we're more informed from our customers, our stakeholders, the voices from the field. So really need to have the flexibility. Is there an example that you can give that, Perfect. Uh, yes. that, that might actually exp uh, uh, show how that happened? So, new kid on the block. We, we, we came to Boston. Um, General Electric came to Boston last year. The GE Jeff Immelt made an um, extraordinary philanthropic uh, commitment to Boston. $50 million over about five years. 15 million of that sits in my portfolio. And we have history, um, we have experience working in community health and underrepresented populations. So we came into Boston with an idea. Um, but we said, you know, this is a new market for us, new geography. Let's kind of hit the pavement and do a listening tour. And let's start building those relationships right out of the gate and learning and listening, so we met with um, stakeholders across the health space here in Boston, 
um, healthcare organizations, academia, thought leaders, other um, uh, funders in the health space, uh, city officials. And what we learned, we listened, we learned, and the resonating themes, two themes came up. Social determinants of health, which you heard a lot about today, and behavioral health and addiction, and in particular, the current focus on the opioid epidemic. So this was not quite what we had in mind, but uh, we went back to our leaders and said, you know what? These two themes came up. They're big areas, tremendous opportunity. We are going to do a deep dive in one. And we changed direction. We had to go back up to our board. We had to have the courage to go back to up our board and say, you know what? This is, this, what we, what we are doing needs to be meaningful to the city of Boston and the state of Massachusetts. And here's the gap, or here's the work that needs to be supported. And we pivoted. And, and just one more question, Jennifer. The challenge of going back to your board, of going back and saying, we're going to do this a little differently, what's involved in even beginning to think about right. needing to do something like that? So that's why I said, you need, when you choose your partners to work with, they have to have similar cultures. So GE does have a culture of pivoting. In fact, Jeff Immelt has a famous saying, you can fail, just fail fast. So fail fast and change direction. So because we have that culture that's, that's really being driven down from our leaders, it wasn't as tough a conversation as it could have been in another organization. Jim, have you had the experience of failing fast? Uh, maybe not fast, <laughs> or not as fast as I would have liked. Um, when I think of our, some of this will be personal, some of this will be the foundation. Um, when I was at CDC, the prevention centers were uh, uh, one of the areas that I was responsible for. I know B BU had one, may still have it. One of the things I remember in visiting one of the communities was the statement of, we don't care what you know until we know that you care. And that that line has always stuck with me because it really reflects, it, it, it reflects that you have to have a relationship. You have to build on that relationship, and that takes time. When you're at a national philanthropy, we're working in communities where we really don't have a relationship. Have we connected with the right people? Have we helped them develop and given them enough time to develop the relationships that they might need to? When you work in communities that are under-resourced, it's often a challenge because their leaders, the organizations that those leaders are part of, are scrambling for every dollar. And so it, you have to be, do it in a way that allows them to come together, not to feel that they're in competition. And uh, that's, a, that's a real struggle at the national level. Yeah. It is a struggle, I think, at the local level, uh, too. I was telling uh, Rain, uh, when you said that you wanted us to be prepared for the uh, what didn't go well, uh, uh, what I reflected back on was Dostoevsky said that every happy family was the same, every dysfunctional family was unique. And so there will always be issues in the, the challenged communities that are going to be unique to those communities. And that's where I think the flexibility that Jennifer mentioned. Jim, could you talk well. a little bit more about, the, about this business, about developing relationships? And indeed, as a national foundation that's coming in that does not have a relationship with the individual community, what are some of the challenges that you have in presenting yourself to the community and in developing a relationship, sometimes one that you need to do in a very rapid motion? So uh, that's, a, that's a great question, and I think what uh, um, we often make sure that the relationships are being developed at the community, not, not really with us. We may come in with uh, something that we think can help. So right now we are involved with 50 cities, and um, there's no way we can have a really good relationship with 50 of them. What we've done is we've said that we'll provide the resources so that they can get together with each other and they can convene the leaders in their community. I went to Richmond um, where the mayor was and a lot of outside groups as the Richmond Foundation has said it's going to embrace culture of health and social determinants and mm -hmm. inequity. And so it was that foundation that really brought people together. They had relationships, they built new ones, but then we're fostering the relationships between these communities to, to learn from each other because we really think that, especially in the middle-sized communities, 
they often don't have the capacity to stay up on all the literature, to know what the best others are doing. Here they can learn as a, as a learning uh, collaborative. So the issue of relationships is, I think, central, but I don't know that it has to be us. It's just that that's what we have to, uh, to foster. I so you've got the relationships developing within the community and, and then, then with among others, the among communities. Exactly. Well. We, um, we have, um, the only lever we have is influence. And the way you have, have influence work is you have to have information. We had the data discussion here and relationships. And then the relationships is about building trust. And that trust is best built before a crisis. Um, so it's almost like a bank account. When you've worked together, you know each other, something goes wrong, you can draw down on it a little bit during that, uh, that tough time. Rain, have you had to um, <laughs> draw down on, on your credit from someplace? <laughs> Oh, too, too many times to, to mention. I think you know, failure is ever present at the micro. And we call them challenges. <laughs> <sector level. laughs> challenges, yeah. I was telling you earlier, it always feels like two steps forward and two steps back. You know, I've been working you know, on behalf of the Clinton Foundation about 15 years in terms of implementing community level programs and scaling those programs. And I started out with a global background. I tend to think of myself as a globalist. And, um, and so focusing really on the community level, one of the challenges is the right level of humility. Um, and it's something that I think many of us who work in population health or public health, we assume a lot of humility on behalf of ourselves and on behalf of our field. Um, and you know, we assume that by the very nature of our work, but I think like real humility, really understanding that just because you may know the best practice for solving a particular situation mm -hmm. in a community, you know, like around food access, for example, it doesn't mean that you have the authority and the true ability to change what's happening in that community. Um, I've been invited to communities as an expert and one time in particular in Oklahoma at Lawton at Fort Sill, you know, showed up to talk in front of this audience and I was asked to come uh, again as an expert um, and I sat down and I looked out in the audience and it's all, you know, members of the Army and about 50 uh, members who had recently returned from Iraq and who had um, very physical, you know, uh, apparent physical disabilities and it was a reminder of the need for humility and to say I, I, I'm still not sure what works um, and what I know is that the process is important and that the process is the product. I know that when we were talking about getting ready for this panel um, there's the focus on sort of the product. I think some of the mistakes that we've made earlier on in the process um, are thinking that the outcome was the penultimate, you know, that that was the ideal, but really it's the process of how we do this with communities, how we show up with humility, with grace, learning, listening, understanding. Our goal is that we want communities and everyone in the community to live their best life, but that looks so radically different in every community and how you get there, you know, that process, helping a community along that process, that's really the, the outcome. So it's interesting as you think about this issue of um, the process as being an important component because the outcome is equally important as well. Yeah. But sometimes when we get involved in projects, we get so involved with the process that we don't get to the outcome. That's right. How do you help communities to begin to kind of manage that business of the importance of both the process and the outcome? Uh, for us, what we try to do as, as much as we can is to have a conversation about what is the vision and to talk about, you know, our vision is that everybody lives their best life and what does that mean for this community? And we ask the community, tell us what that means for you. And in some communities, you know, uh, I'll give you one in particular, uh, Knox County, Illinois, small, you know, post-industrial, suburban, rural, and they've lost all their major employers. They had two left that they just lost within the last six months. For them, it means having dignity. Um, it means finding a path forward for that community, which is not about health. Um, for them, it's about jobs and other things, but they feel very strongly that if they can promote health, that that is one avenue, if they can commit together, that they should at the very least be healthy, and for them that's very broad, it's, you know, it's mental, it's physical, um, that that's their best, 
best path forward to attracting new employers and attracting other things. In other communities, it's it's very, very sophisticated. You know, we work in Houston with GE and with other partners where it means very many different things. So having a clear vision for what health improvement looks like across Houston, it's it's quite varied, but it's having that conversation to say, you know, we're, we want to help drive the process, uh, but the community has to ultimately decide and tell us what the vision is for health improvement. And then for us, it falls under the social determinants, but the emphasis on which categories will really depend on what the community says is their vision. And it's that constant conversation between the vision and the process. So we're driving towards this, and this is the process, and never losing sight of both. And that's hard to do. You know, people talk about having neutral conveners and building movements and, and building coalitions, but it's a very difficult, very tricky process, and you have to, it has to be a living process that you constantly reinvent and revisit. Both are important. Both the are process important. and the outcome. Absolutely. Rick, this I, I want to jump off on one piece that Rain talked about, and it's the issue around who's the expert. But, and and I, I'm wondering at first if you'll tell us a little bit more about Wellville. And then secondly, I want you to talk about, so who's the expert when we start talking about communities working together? Yeah, um, well, first of all, um, the road to Wellville is paved with breakdowns and failures, so I have plenty to share. Uh, this can be a confessional. Um, so Wellville, uh, I think, is somewhat unique because it's a, it's a five-community, uh, ten-year initiative that was started not by someone from the health sector but from um, an angel investor who has been a significant force in the technology sector, not necessarily uh, health technologies. Uh, and this is Esther Dyson. Um, so you know, Esther has invested in uh, startups. Um, and uh, we take a startup approach. Uh, and really, in this case, the community is the startup and the product is health. Um, so what that means is that we see things through an investor lens. Um, we come to understand uh, what is a good bet in terms of producing health outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, causes a different kind of conversation in the community uh, around where we might invest if we could uh, free up uh, dollars that we're spending in one place and put them in another place. Um, so uh, because uh, of Esther and, and um, technology and failing forward as sort of in her DNA, uh, that's really um, influenced our approach with our communities. But I have to say, it was a huge, in the words of one community member, culture bump. Uh, because most of the people we're working with in communities are from public health or from the health system or faith organizations or community-based organizations, not from high tech and the startup world. And so we have worked our way through finding common language. Uh, we have worked our way through um, not uh, being the expert that imposes um, what we think are good ideas on communities. Um, and it has not always been easy, but I think uh, what we have found is that we fill each other's blind spots. Um, so I think expertise is um, shared. Um, so as a couple of examples of breakdowns, when we started uh, Wellville, uh, in 2014, we selected our five communities. We thought it was going to be a competition, and we thought that competition among five cities, communities, um, would drive greater outcomes. And what we quickly found out is that um, competition causes uh, hoarding of information and you know, a, a you lack of trust. You mean people don't play fairly? And, right. And yeah. uh, what the communities told us is that we, we'd rather be in collaboration than competition. And so we pivoted. We, we shifted. Um, we uh, had a couple of instances where we thought technology would be a good answer for uh, some of the gaps in the communities. One was a text messaging platform to fill the gaps among care coordinators. Um, miserable failure uh, because uh, what we didn't appreciate is how important that voice-to-voice -voice connection was between the care coordinators and the individuals. And really all we did was take care coordinators away from that personal relationship and tried to get them proficient in a technology that, that failed anyway. Another failure was we had um, a potential partner in a very large uh, cognitive computing uh, organization that said, we want to bring our technology, our, our big data technology, to your five communities. And we thought this was a great idea. And uh, one of the breakdowns that occurred was actually a number of community members saying, 
So this very large successful organization is going to come in here and take our data and develop algorithms and become more powerful and develop you know, greater wealth. And, and what do we get for that? And I said, well, you get you know, health. health. And, and they said, no, we, we need to be paid for that. So I, I think you know, it's this humility that Rain talks about um, and really uh, coming to appreciate you know, how you can move forward together with good ideas. We've had some of those too, so when we talk about successes, I'll share those. Um, but one last- We're not gonna talk about successes today. Oh, okay, good. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll, because I'll, everybody, I mean, we could all talk about our successes, yeah, right? And it would just right. be wonderful. But how boring would that be? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so another um, oh, you have challenge. More. Uh, oh, I've got, uh, oh, I've okay, got plenty. Right, right. Uh, per personal, like Jim and, and uh, uh, lots of uh, ones through Wellville. I, the last one I'll share um, for now is uh, we started out with five communities. And after, and we started out in 2015 officially. Um, and we were working, uh, I would say, extremely well in four communities. And in one community, um, we were not uh, seeing results on our side or the community side. And we sort of uh, struggled with that for a number of months. And finally, we uh, sort of mutually made a tough decision to say, we just, we just can't find a way to work together. Uh, the community didn't understand what value we were providing. And we felt as though we weren't br being brought in fully enough to actually make any kind of a difference at all. And we were both spending a lot of resources on it. So you know, now we're sort of rooting each other, but we're on separate paths. So I think you know, part of what we've learned is that uh, there are I think practices, and, and Rain, I appreciate your um, you know, thoughts on, on process and how important it is, because I think that's what it takes. Because you will find, um, you will inevitably hit um, breakdowns, uh, because we're trying to do something really different, which is you know, upend the status quo. Uh, and that's firmly rooted in all sorts of systems and incentives. And you're going to hit all kinds of roadblocks. But I think what's most important is finding the way forward through trusting relationships, and really having endurance uh, to, you know, to learn from those break, breakdowns and, and move I want to pick up and, and talk, Tom, about your experience four years ago when the marathon experienced certainly the biggest breakdown that any of us could have ever experienced. And, and the challenge to, to you and to the organization in thinking about, so how, one, do you even begin to plan for something as horrific as that? Uh, and, and then how do you begin to recover? The, the most important word in planning uh, was, remains, preparedness, uh, being ready for anything. People will say, did you, did you, have, a, did you have a plan for a bomb at Exeter Street and a bomb at Fairfield Street. No, but a very, very deep level of preparedness for trouble of some kind, of every kind. And a group of people who had both the training and the courage to make decisions under stress uh, in, in the most difficult of, uh, of circumstances. If you look at what any of us does as as a leader in our businesses, and you're probably all leaders or you wouldn't be here, or in the military, or in any other kind of organization, what do you do as a leader? You start off by setting very broad objectives, visions, define objectives, and then train, and train, and train, and train. And then in the end, you trust. And the people who were involved that day had been doing that for years. And they were, to put another word on it, engaged. Uh, and they were engaged to respond in a disciplined way. And they had a shared set of values, all of which are the sorts of things we're hearing about in, in projects here. Uh, and so when that happened, there were a great many people who were willing to, to take action on their own in a situation for which nobody can be prepared in that kind of a situation. Now, how do you carry on thereafter? Uh, you continue to celebrate those very values. You celebrate those people and say, oh my god, look what you did. I just came from a luncheon looking forward to this year's marathon, which is in 12 days, uh, with all of the public safety agencies that are involved. So it's the cities and towns along the route, it's the Massachusetts State Police, it's the National Guard, it's the CIA, it's the FBI, it's Homeland Security, uh, and more than anything else, saying to them, thank you. W without what all of you people do, engaged with all of us, what happened, the, the response that we saw 
couldn't have taken place. Uh, I think I mentioned this to the group the other day, about the only thing I ever did of interest to my children, uh, who think dad is not interesting, uh, <laughs> was a very brief little TED talk I was asked to do about a year after all that, in which I was asked, why, how can you explain the response of the people around here uh, and the response of people around the world who sent $80 million to the, to the One Fund? And both the title and the recurring theme of that were, in Boston, everyone owns the marathon. Uh, so put a word on that, it's engagement. There's been a high level of engagement, and that's true, I'm sure, for any successful project anyone here works on. Well, as certainly someone, and I'm certainly, there are many other people who are in this room who were very impacted by it because we were all here, um, I can appreciate the level of response that was provided. Um, I think none of us will ever recover from, from that, but it is certainly something that is always on our minds and wish you the best for, for the upcoming uh, marathon in the next 12 days. Well, thank you, and I have every confidence that anyone and everyone who is involved will do their very best to make sure it happens because, uh, in the words of David Ortiz, it's our freaking city. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to I want to shift gears just a little bit and talk about the issue of compromise, because indeed as we work with members of our community, as we set up any number of programs, one of the things that becomes, especially as we're planning, one of the important things is the need to compromise. And, and I'm wondering the experiences that you may have had of needing to compromise or maybe it's not a good thing to do to compromise. I am always convinced that people do it my way that it will all really be all right and no one has taken me up on that just yet. But, but, but compromise clearly as we think about planning is one of those important things and I'm wondering if you could talk some about experiences that you've had as you are working with community groups in this and, and Rain I see you shaking your head so I, this, I think this resonates with you. It does and I think for, for us you know, com compromise, I feel like all we do is compromise and partnership. Everything is done through compromise and partnership but it means for us going in and very clearly knowing what we want to accomplish and the, I always say there's a floor and a ceiling to what I want to accomplish and that goal and how far down am I willing to compromise and I know that going into every conversation into every relationship into every partnership that that's critical um, because without that knowledge of what's the absolute bar where I'm, I'm not willing to compromise anymore where I know if I make this change or if I give too much then we don't accomplish our overall goal at what point do I have to be authoritative mm. versus you know kind of acquiesce to some degree so I think that knowledge and empowering sort of everybody who works on the partnership with that knowledge being very clear that there's tremendous room for compromise and how you get there and what it looks like but at the end of the day there's a floor um, because otherwise we won't accomplish our goals. You know, so if I had said to McDonald's, yeah, sure, it's okay to go ahead and add back in, you know, um, certain food additives or to do certain things in terms of the kinds of food that you're providing to children, it, we wouldn't have accomplished the goal. But knowing that there was some floor and knowing that there are some things that they might not be able to do in communities around the world uh, in terms of food availability, um, is just realistic. And so, again, I think it goes back to really knowing what your goals are and where that floor and that ceiling for compromise sit. Jen, have you had to compromise? Sure. Oh, Jim or Jen? Both. <laughs> yes. Oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> um, certainly, absolutely, especially when you're working with multiple stakeholders. And, um, you know, oftentimes we bring, I bring my Six Sigma background. Um, I grew up in GE. I grew up under the Jack Welsh era with uh, Six Sigma and Quality Improvement Science. And, you know, if you've got multiple stakeholders, partners, you know what the shared common vision is, you know what the sandbox that you need to play in. And then, you know, we often do the, the plus minuses, right? The pros, the cons, high risk, high reward. You do that four blocker. And everybody gets a voice. Everybody feels like they've been heard. And then when you lay it out, and how, it, how everybody's wants and needs lay out as compared to what the overall vision is, the path becomes a lot easier to find and those that do compromise hmm. see it and they feel that they've been heard and that they were part of the, the conversation and the decision making. Jim? I'm gonna uh, touch on something they both uh, said early in their remarks. 
it's a lot easier to compromise when you've got a shared vision and goals. Mm -hmm. So if you are really well connected on, on where you're, you're hoping the community can go, what are the, the big issues, then you can start to say, what's the project? What are we going to work on? How are we going to measure the outcomes? And that's where compromise is possible because everybody sees they're in this together. That's part of the relationship uh, building, uh, frankly. Whether whatever process you have for, for narrowing that down, the fact that people are all feeling heard is the, is the most crucial. And when you manage a process uh, like that, you want to make sure that what you've chosen you can succeed at so that there are early wins or there are, uh, there's obvious progress because that starts to strengthen the sense that we working together can get big things uh, done. And celebrate those and, wins. And absolutely celebrate those things. I want to pick up on, uh, on uh, earlier comments about things that uh, didn't work or how you have to prepare. Mm. Um, in any of these, you need to give away credit. And, and, you, can, and cred, you can give away more than 100% of credit. Credit can be like the biblical loaves and fishes. You give it away and there's still <laughs> some left over uh, for you. But that's the way you've got to treat your partners, that they feel you're recognizing their work, their contribution, and how it's helped this uh, project succeed, and that they're all getting um, maybe even more recognition than some might think they deserve. That's, that's really, really important, and uh, fortunately, it's once recognized, easy to do. It is critically important to be able to say thank you to people and to, and to recognize what they do and what they do well. It encourages them to go on to the next place. Rick, I'm wondering if you can kind of reflect on this issue around leadership. So, so clearly one part of leadership is recognizing where individuals are and what they have done, but, but none of the projects that we're talking about actually happen without some component of leadership and somebody being in charge. Can you talk some more about how you help to develop that leadership within communities, um, especially as you come in as someone who's from the outside and says, mm. I think something ought to happen, or maybe people in the community decide something needs to happen. Can you, can you reflect on this issue of leadership? Sure. Uh, two examples in different places. Sure. One, um, before uh, working with Esther on Wellville, um, I was at a large insurance company. I worked for Cigna for about a decade. And um, while I was there, uh, probably around 2004, I became aware of the social determinants of health and my you know, my, my all of my assumptions about health and health care just, you know, blew away. And uh, I uh, met uh, Lisa um, Berkman's uh, uh, colleague, Len Syme, at UC Berkeley, and, and he came into Cigna and began um, educating others within Cigna about social determinants of health. And this was still sort of early days, at least inside the traditional health care world of talking about social determinants. So, um, so I... This was sort of an opportunity that um, I, I could have gone down a particular direction, which was to say, you know what, really nothing, uh, or in, in com compared to social determinants of health, the stuff that we're focusing on at, at Cigna uh, um, is, is so small and so tiny, and, and, you know, there's this big opportunity in social determinants. But really, to the credit of the leadership of Cigna, um, we came to understand that this was like an enormous opportunity for the Cygnus of the world, because uh, Cigna at the time had a mission to improve health. And under that banner, um, you know, Cigna was really focused on something that probably matters, it's about 20% of what matters to health, you know, the traditional healthcare system. So instead of being sort of threatened by this, again, um, and David Cordani, who's uh, still the leader of Cigna, uh, saw this as a big opportunity and um, uh, allowed uh, three of us at Cigna to go and launch an initiative called Communities of Health, which was like a frontline R&D organization to work with six communities around the country and really through multi-sector uh, partnerships understand um, what are the big drivers of health at a community level and what are the opportunities for the traditional um, healthcare financing and delivery system. I think that that's leadership. Uh, it's recognizing that there's a bigger space and an opportunity to play, but also being disciplined around uh, the role that you know you and your organization play. Totally uh, different example. Um, 
I have been um, involved in a number of communities, either th through Cigna or the work that I've done since leaving Cigna, and I, and I have been thrown out of a couple of communities, by the way. Um, and there was one uh, in instance that I'll share where um, uh, things got extremely tense. And what was happening is that there was a, a small group of us, uh, this was during the Cigna time, working with a uh, community and uh, thinking that we were, we were doing pretty well. You know, we were bringing something to the table. Um, this group of multi-sector uh, stakeholders were bringing something to the table. Um, about maybe the fourth time we were out there, uh, really rolling up our sleeves and doing work, um, a woman uh, who was sit seated uh, to the left of me in this stakeholder meeting said, just what was it you thought you were going to do in my community? Mm -hmm. And I froze, uh, couldn't speak, uh, my, and you know, eventually found my voice again. Um, but I bring this up because I think, to your question, there is something that an outsider can uh, bring to the surface in a community. And what was happening is that uh, this woman was being marginalized uh, within her own community group. And she wanted to play a role that we were usurping, uh, coming in from the outside. And I think that um, there's an opportunity for um, our local leaders in Wellville uh, to use us in a particular way. And, and I think that role of the outsider can be like a mirror. Uh, and some t sometimes that mirror is reflecting back to the community uh, just how wonderful they are and you know, uh, the amazing work they're doing day in, day in and day out and they can't always uh, see for themselves. And in other times, I think it's like a lightning rod uh, and helping them get to the source of um, issues, potentially breakdowns, uh, that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. Mm. So interesting about this idea of who directs activities. So indeed, being an outsider, you can be that lightning rod sometimes. But one of the things that I always like to say to my students is that we've got to listen to the people that are in the community. <laughs> they need to be the people mm. who are driving the programs that we are, that, that, that are being put forth. I'm going to turn to all of you in just a moment and ask you what worked and what didn't work so please get that uh, in your heads and if you if you don't have it I will call on you so think <laughs> think about what you might want to say before I call on you but but in the moment while you're thinking about that Tom you throw the biggest party, the biggest party that Boston has once a year. It's a wonderful activity. I suspect that you must plan for it a year in advance or maybe years in advance for each party that you have. And that one of the important pieces of that is engaging many partners in working with this. Could you talk about some of the complexity of engaging parties in the work that you are doing around either the marathon or some of the other work that, that you are involved in in the association? Well, the marathon is what is known the best. And of course, there are a great many parties, and they don't all have the same interests, and sometimes they clash. There are, for example, people who would like to be able to drive across their town that day, uh, and they are unable to, to, uh, to... Some of the people in this room. I, 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 I don't doubt it, and I have every confidence I will meet them later. Uh, uh, but, but moving to completely different events, uh, much smaller things. Uh, uh, our broad mission is the promotion of health and fitness. And so we will endeavor to create events and programs to advance that. And there are times when it works and there are times when it doesn't. And usually it's because our interests turn out to be different. The vision turns out to be different. I once upon a time thought that we could begin to engage a community with a nice holiday run. And we'll get people out running and they'll have fun and we can build on that and we'll get a famous athlete or two to come out there. And it had no legs at all. Uh, because it turned out that there wasn't really a shared commitment to fitness in getting out there that day. It had much more to do with holiday beverages laced with rum. And so if what we're really after uh, is longer term programs, we need to learn to, to identify those areas of the community that are perhaps underserved in our area. We can use data from our other events to find out who, who we're not reaching. We can engage with other members other trusted members of the community. We do a run now with the Dimmick Health Center, which is here in Roxbury, uh, uh, using them and the kid programs that we do for a lot of children to bring families together to sure. come out and run. So instead of people living in the community saying, well, for crying out loud, who are these knuckleheads in the shorts that are clogging up our streets? one builds with those pieces to create something that, that engages everybody and, and can be sustained. Uh, but so, so there's one of my many missteps and something that 
sort of worked out. Yeah, thank uh, you. I, so I'm wondering from those of you here who are here about things, when you think about program activities that you've been involved in or ways that you've engaged with the various communities that you have been involved with, wh what worked or maybe what didn't work? They all averted their eyes from me. Yes. <laughs> so um, no one talked. I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a question that's not quite that. But um, <laughs> I did pause. <laughs> you know, you give people a microphone and they take over. First, stand up. Uh, yeah. Hi. Yeah, and, and what's your name and where are you from? Um, my name is Portia Singh. Um, I'm with Phillips Research North America. Um, and just to this panel, um, I know that we're talking about uh, implementing programs. Um, the, um, I guess, um, when communities are being gingerfied, how do we um, handle that in the midst of implementing these public health um, programs that may, uh, where the community face might change in the next five to 10 years? I'll, I'll, it sounds like you have, because I'm going to call on Dan Merrigan right here to talk okay. about a project as well. Oh, great. Well, so I'll, get I'll ready, be Dan. quick. I, I, th I think you, you know, hit, hit on a really extraordinarily important topic. And I, I was at a session last week for the Spark Communities, um, which is an, a, a $90 million development initiative with six big cities. And this, that was a central theme. It's uh, how, how do you do development without displacement? And, I, I mean, my, my sense is that it takes these, like, extraordinary measures to um, avoid that, you know, uh, because the market forces are so big. And so uh, in our Wellville communities, um, this is an issue in um, Hartford, where I spend most of my time. There's a $32 million development project of a former factory, which is now being um, renovated for multi-use. Um, and, uh, you know, I think residents uh, view it with both, you know, optimism and skeptic skepticism. Um, part of what's happening in Hartford is a resident um, leadership development I initiative, and I think our success is really going to be tied to how, how big of a leadership role do residents have in not only this redevelopment, but in the overall transformation of uh, this part of Hartford. Um, so I, I it's... Uh, it is, it is a uh, burning issue for us, and I think, I think what we're seeing is that um, when you can have a community organizing approach um, as part of a development effort, uh, I, maybe it it's, can be more successful in uh, not displacing residents. There may be, uh, Jim. I was going to comment on a smaller example, though we've got a lot of them. Um, early on, we took our first commission to build a healthier America, which purpose was to look at the social uh, determinants and how uh, to elevate their visibility. We took them to a new supermarket in Philadelphia. It had gotten a lot of uh, space because they need to be uh, large and, and all of that. And the person who put, it was a commercial supermarket, you know, had to make a profit and all of that. And they, he was from Philadelphia. He had about nine of them, but none in Philadelphia. But he spent a lot of time with uh, what kinds of foods do they want? Could they set up jobs? How many jobs? Could there be training for the, you know, the people from the community uh, so that they could advance with, within the, uh, the supermarket? They set up a community room because there were no places for community groups to meet that could be then just signed up for, not, mm -hmm. not rented. So they're, they're, that's the kind of, how do you go about doing that? And how do you do that in a way that is... Uh, authentic um, and and take the time to do it. Uh, in, in this instance, uh, we were very impressed, thought he uh, did it very well, and that's why we wanted the commission to see it uh, as an example. Um, but we we know that it's a, a challenge in in the uh, community development work about even even uh, 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 low income housing because it'll usually there's uh, housing that will be. Uh, moved from that area or removed or the people who were there do they get a call to be in the new place there's a huge amount of that one of the things we've just recently seen is as everybody is a uh, cities have gotten popular and so that uh, more people are moving in and uh, that is a gentrification displacement yeah. and uh, life expectancy in cities in aggregate is going up and the smallest the smaller the community the uh, the less the progress, and in the smallest communities, 
uh, real uh, reductions where they don't have as much uh, infrastructure. But if you're a mayor or if you're a city council, having people who can pay taxes is a good thing. So it's how do you balance those competing interests that, that uh, you talked about? Because in fact, that's, that's the purpose of bringing community together. That's the purpose of having a transparent process so you can balance those, those competing interests. Dan, could you talk some about the challenges of the community that you live in, the South End, sure. at, which is experiencing exactly what our questioner was asking about? Sure. Um, you have to stand up. <laughs> Tell them where you okay. are. Tell them who you are. I'm Dan Merrigan. I'm a professor here at the School of Public Health, and I live in this neighborhood. I live maybe a 15-minute walk that way. And I, I, in my home, I've been in my home for about 25 years. And when I moved into this neighborhood, it looked very different than it looks today. When I moved into the neighborhood, most of the row houses, interspersed among them, were a lot of single-room occupancy and people who were, as my mom would say, you know, poor souls and down on their luck and you know trying to make it. It's now one of the most coveted parts of the city to live in. It's, um, it's, it's accessible to everywhere. It's near the back bay. It's near the theater district. You can walk around. And it's changed. We really have had gentrification. We have $2.5, $3 million condos right next to a house that may have multi-levels with um, people who are quite poor. Um, and it's challenging. Um, to, say, to say the least. This morning there were comments talking about the, all the wonderful things about Boston, and it's all true. But I think in some ways our community here in the South End represents sort of that dichotomy between the very rich and the very poor. And it gets played out and it's visible in, in many ways. Here at the School of Public Health we have the activist lab that we've talked about earlier today. And we're involved with a number of organizations in this community. There's a Blackstone Community Center. It's a multi-service center for youth and families. And then across the street from that is the South End Community Health Center. And we've had conversations. Multi we, we as a school are in relationship with, with these organizations, and we're doing some creative things together. But in conversations, what we're realizing is both of these organizations have are accessible to everyone in the community. But the, the, gentry, the gentry are not using them. And I really see, and I'm a resident here, and I walk back and forth every day, and one of my concerns is we, if we don't think more creatively on how to unify this community, it's gonna lose its value. The social capital is gonna dwindle. Um, and it can happen at multiple levels. And I think a lot of the remarks about leadership and shared leadership that have been talked about today is where where it begins. I think we have to be more creative in the way we bring people together to relate, not at their economic level or their education level, but more at their at the level of humanity. And I think that's an example of you know, how we can, if we're really interested in doing community-based um, work that's empowering, that we, we do that. And I, we have the BU Fitwell, the university made this in tremendous commitment of like $5 million in this, this center to have a state-of-the-art fitness center. I think that's one way of bringing people together. Um, Thank you very so. much, Dan. Others, other thoughts? Things that have worked well, things that may not have worked so well. Carol? Yes. Robert. Uh, nicely helped put maybe even a couple of my colleagues on the spot for a minute because we've had the pleasure of working with just about everyone on this panel in one way or another. Uh, in some of our various endeavors, but uh, I'll start by saying in Houston, Texas with, with RAIN, with the Clinton Health Matters Initiative was where we made the jump from doing a program that was very based largely in our own employee world to the larger world of real population and community health, and Alan Gilbert, who's back here, uh, uh, led that effort. And one of the first things we learned was that while all that stuff we heard on the panels earlier about how fast data moves and how much data there is and how it's all a very technologically enhanced world and there's enormous potential in it, the human element still takes time. And I think, you know, as we, we built out this document with them called the Blueprint for Better Health for Harris, Houston and Harris County, 
And Houston is a very different place from Boston, from Cincinnati, from Erie, from Louisville. Um, the fourth largest city in the country, but not just in terms of population, but just in geographical spread. Uh, those of you who know Houston know that it's a city virtually without zoning ordinances. Um, and uh, that actually is a good metaphor for how it can be to work in some communities because uh, there were a lot of people who had not worked together and had not seen each other as partners in, in building a healthier city. And Alan went and spent, I don't know how much time in Houston, you know, months and months with Rain and with the team there, and just bringing these people who did not have a relationship with one another heretofore, uh, and, and getting them into the same room and to see a common vision of where they could go. Um, and then I came along into the process too, and, and then Michelle Zamperetti, who's our colleague here as well. We've all been very engaged in Houston and for a long time, and still for Michelle, it's almost a second home, but watching how Houston has turned that corner uh, has been, gave us a, a lot of terrific insight. And so much so that what we realized was this notion of the human dynamic was really not unique to Houston. And so that, that's what led to us doing the Healthy Cities leadership effort, which a number of you have been uh, involved with. And what we realized that in some cities, people are very well connected into each other in networks that you can springboard from, and I think Boston's a good example. It's a real asset this city has. But other places, that whole notion of basic leadership teaching and leadership capability uh, had, a, had a ways to go. And there's no different, and it's very interesting. You can't just say it's one type of cities. When we got everyone together in Crotonville, and you guys keep me honest on this, but it was interesting, cities like Charlotte, they had a culture of this and they had all worked together and they, they knew one another and they came in uh, with a very team-centric uh, city approach. Other much smaller towns, uh, like I think our friends from up in Dartmouth, they met at the airport flying to the event, a number of them. So they had not had this culture of working together and this, this culture of leadership. So what we recognize, you know, we kind of went into this thinking, oh great, we will help bring all of these terrific experts in, uh, in population health to these communities and we will help facilitate this flow of, of information. But what we realized there was this critical step that, that we appreciated after Houston, which is we first had to sort of uh, inculcate with this, this, this notion of how the community could work together. And so we used our leadership training center in, out in Crotonville, uh, and we built this program around first teaching leadership. Uh, and then from that, in bringing in all of the lessons of, of how you make the, the community healthier. And these guys just have done a phenomenal job over the last two or three years in, in making that happen. I hope I did justice to it, because if, if I left anything out, Michelle or Alan can, can add to it. But really what we learned from that is you, you, you can't rush the human process and you need to bring people together and get those communities to gel in ways and see what the possibilities are. And then all, any number of things are possible from that. But you can't leave that step out of it. Thank you very much, Robert. I, I'm going to ask our panelists as we, as we begin to wrap up our session. It, it, so you, you, we've got many people in our audience. Some are people who have been doing the work for a while. Others are people who are students who are beginning to think about doing the work. But if you were to create the manual that for how to do this work, what's one thing that you would want to make certain that was in that manual for people who are either already doing the work and who are looking how to do it better, or others who are beginning to think about being involved in the work? What's the one thing that you would want to make certain that was in that manual? I see you all raise your hands. Jennifer. So I would say make sure that you have all the right eyes on the complex problem. These are complex problems, tend to perhaps not involve as many partners as you can. So make sure your reach is broad so that you get um, diversity of thought and perspective. Thank you. I would say uh, it's flip, flip the narrative on how health, health is cre uh, created. Uh, in, in our communities, um, communities are often viewed as the recipient of services and you know, to flip that to communities as the source of health production. And I think that um, that's, that's really what's happening in a number of places. Um, a very quick example, uh, in one of our communities, a food desert, uh, there's a conversation right now about do we bring in a supermarket operator like a Whole Foods or do we create uh, in 
resident-owned co-op. And mm -hmm. obviously, uh, they have different implications in terms of community ownership and wealth creation. And I think when the community sees itself as the source of the production of health, um, you know, it makes different decisions about how to um, take ownership of that and uh, thrive. Uh, this community has to be a part. Uh, you not the only uh, has a, to part be a part is, is the center or the source of health production. Probably yeah. uh, health systems and payers are more reliant on communities uh, being the source of health than <laughs> communities may be relying on uh, health systems and payers. Yeah. Thank you. Jim. So I've already mentioned the issue of credit and how to give it away. But I think the other part is the leaders have to be from the community. You can be there, you can have resource, you can have expertise, but the patience is going to come from those who will be there uh, over time. And you can't put someone in charge. You can say, who can bring um, credibility to the table, but it's got to be for working at a community as a whole, it's got to be a, a, an array of leaders who um, learn if they don't know, but learn to, to lead where they have no authority and very little resources. And so that is about then relationships because almost every problem that is a really serious one, you don't have the relationships, especially you don't have the, the resources in the communities that uh, have the greatest needs to try to spend your way to better. Yeah. Tom. So picking up on Jennifer, engage, listen, enforce discipline, and trust. Trust, an incredibly important component. Yeah. yeah. Rain. I, all, all those things, I think I would just endorse that and just that knowing that your role is to always foster understanding. You know, I think the thing that all of these pieces are certainly important, and I come back to the point that Jim raised to us a little earlier that if you put all of these things in a basket, they will multiply and we will have many loaves and fishes. <laughs> Please thank our panelists. Great to meet you. We're going to now take a five minute break. <laughs>